A second day of talks takes place between Iran and six world powers over Iran's nuclear program. And it's apparent there are serious obstacles to an agreement. We ask, what's next in the standoff between Washington and Tehran? You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu. Two days of talks between Iran and six world powers have ended in Baghdad without any concrete agreement, except to meet again next month in Moscow. At the heart of the talks is an attempt by the United States and other world powers to persuade Iran to accept immediate restrictions on its nuclear program. The United States believes the Iranians want to build atomic weapons, but Tehran denies this and says its nuclear reactors will be used only for energy and research purposes. Known as the P5 plus 1 group, the powers negotiating with Iran include the five permanent members of the UN Security Council plus Germany. They want Iran to stop enriching uranium to a concentration of 20%. They say at that level, it's easy to enrich the uranium further to develop weapons-grade material. Meanwhile, the Iranians went into the negotiations seeking an easing of crippling economic sanctions, which have primarily targeted its oil exports. After the talks concluded, the EU foreign policy chief, Catherine Ashton, had this to say. We expect Iran to take concrete and practical steps to urgently meet the concerns of the international community, to build confidence and to meet its international obligations. In line with our agreement in Istanbul, the E3 plus 3 laid out clear proposals to address the Iranian nuclear issue and in particular all aspects of 20% enrichment. Iran declared its readiness to address the issue of 20% enrichment and came with its own five-point plan, including their assertion that we recognize their right to enrichment. Hans Blix was the former chief weapons inspector for the United Nations in the run-up to the US-led invasion of Iraq. I asked him what the US and the other powers might offer in return for Iran restricting its nuclear enrichment to just 20%. They were willing to offer the Iranian spare part for airplanes. That may not sound like very much, but maybe they have offered more. And maybe they need more talks in, in between to, to get to something which both sides find valuable. You know, there are some critics, yourself included, that say that maybe these talks need a little bit more imagination. Uh, what about a more comprehensive agreement, perhaps the option of looking at a nuclear-free zone in the Middle East? Of course, that would mean that a country like Israel would first have to admit that it has nuclear weapons and then give them up. Is, is that an option? I think so. Uh, at the end of the year, there is scheduled to be a conference in Helsinki organized by the UN. And that is about a nuclear weapon-free zone. But of course, one cannot reasonably go to Helsinki and just discuss a zone for your weapons. That will hit the Israelis, but it will not touch the, the Iranian enrichment plants. I think Israel ought to, ought to be in Israel's interest to avoid that there will be any enrichment plants or reprocessing plants anywhere in the Middle East, whether in Iran or in, in, in Saudi Arabia or in Egypt, because Israel has a strategy to bomb uh, nuclear installations in Iraq in Iraq and then later in, in, in Syria and now they're talking about Iran. This cannot go on forever. So the question will be for the Israelis, are they willing to sacrifice their own nuclear weapons which they have regarded as a life insurance, but in return getting a well uh, verified zone free of also fuel cycle activities, that's say enrichment and reprocessing. I think the whole Middle East would benefit from that, but it's very hard act to take. A threat by the Israelis to bomb Iran, and in some instances by the United States, although not in as so many words. Um, how serious is that threat taken? I mean, is it something that could happen? Well, uh, different people have different views, but um, when you listen to the uh, Israeli prime minister and you listen to high military people, there certainly there's a group of people in, in Israel who are who's ready to do so. My impression is that the United States does not want it. The U.S. has withdrawn from Iraq, they're going out of Afghanistan, and I don't think the U.S. public really wants another war anywhere. Uh, and I think that Europeans are also very far from it. And I also doubt somewhat that the threat of going to military action is useful. I think it's, it, from the Iranian side, is taken more as a humiliation 
whereas the economic sanction is somewhat different. It is not illegal in the first place. A military attack, I think, would be a violation of the UN Charter. Iran has not attacked anybody, and the Security Council will not give any authorization. So the economic pressures, I think, is one thing. Military action, I think, is illegal, and I think it will also be counterproductive, very dangerous. Now, one of the uh, demands by the West, the, rather by the world powers here, is that uh, inspectors be allowed unfettered access to these sites, that they can carry out comprehensive monitoring and inspections. Do you see that happening realistically? Yes. I, if, if the Iranians are not uh, really do, making a bombing, I don't see why they should be opposed to it. And the meeting in Tehran recently by the IEA Director General Amano and the Iranians seem to have confirmed that the Iranians are willing to uh, allow and invite the IEA inspectors even at Parchin, which is a big military site. And where well, they have had, had discussions before, there was some suspicion that they have had an explosion test chamber and uh, apparently uh, the Iranians are ready to open that up. I think one must have some understanding for the Iranians saying that you cannot just pick any place in this huge military site. Uh, no country, unless it is occupied, will allow foreign inspectors to go just anywhere. So there might have been some progress there, but, but the meeting in Iran was not anything sensational. It was a small step forward and uh, not really a key to uh, the opening of the discussions in Baghdad. You know, the talks will now continue in Moscow on the 19th and 20th of next month. Uh, is that simply kicking the can down the road? I mean, can we expect something uh, concrete to happen before the U.S. election? Well, I think the Russians have, have all the time they have been against any military action. They're also skeptical about the economic sanctions, and they feel that talks are and, and, and better offers to the Iranians is the only thing that will work. The Russia is, after all, much closer to Iran and, than the United States is. So I'm sure the Russians are quite interested in avoiding that the Iranians get nuclear weapons. The same is probably true for, for the Chinese. And the Russians have talked about a step-by-step -step approach. Exactly what they meant by that, we don't know. But I, I think they are, they are deeply engaged in it, and they will try their, their hardest to get to some, some deal. So, can a deal be reached on Iran's nuclear program? To discuss this, I'm joined in the studio by Lawrence Korb, a former U.S. Assistant Secretary of Defense, who is now a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress. Also in the studio is Trita Parsi, the founder and president of the National Iranian American Council. And from New York, Human Majid joins us. He's an Iranian-American journalist. He's also advised the former Iranian President Khatami on his visit to the United States. Gentlemen, thanks to all of you for joining us uh, on this show. Trita, let me start with you. You know, the talks in Baghdad are finished. They will resume in Moscow next month. And at the end of those talks, Catherine Ashton, who led the world powers into the negotiations, said that there is some common ground, but uh, there are also very big differences. So where are we now? Well, I think, first of all, we have to commend the Obama administration for having put together a diplomatic process. We've not seen this in the past, uh, particularly from the U.S. side. There has been attempts at diplomacy, but at times, it's almost given the impression that everyone was looking for the uh, first best excuse to just call the diplomacy dead and move on to something else. Now we see the opposite. Even though there hasn't been any direct progress on the substance issue, the process is kept alive because I think the desire on all sides is actually quite strong to try to find an agreement, even though there obviously are going to be some significant stumbling blocks. And I think what happened in Baghdad may have been um, somewhat calculated in the sense that there was an awareness that there is enough time for an additional meeting before European and American sanctions kick in on July 1st. And as a result, all sides could potentially have afforded to open up the negotiations with very, very hard opening positions, knowing very well that even if they don't reach an agreement, there's one more chance to sit down and talk. Okay, well, let's take a look at a map which shows the extent of Iran's known nuclear program. There are five known nuclear sites. Iran says they're all used for civilian purposes. In addition, Iran also has three uranium mines, and there are other military and research sites that will be of interest to in nuclear inspectors should they gain access to the country. Let's go to Human Majid in New York. Um, under the terms of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, of which, of course, Iran is a signatory, uh, is Iran allowed to enrich uranium? Of course, yes. Of course it is. It's allowed to enrich uranium up to any percent, actually, um, a purity. Um, they previously were only enriching to 3.5% uh, and only started enriching to 20% uh, after the deals to um, swap that fuel for their Tehran reactor was uh, that enriched uranium uh, fell apart. 
So yes, under the NPT, of course they are, and that's why they're sticking to that to that point uh, so strongly for the last 10 years. And I don't think they're going to give it up. I don't think they're ever going to give that up. It's now analogous to you know the 1950s nationalization of oil for the Iranians. Uh, you know, it's it's a matter of national pride. It's a matter of rights. It's a matter of not being subservient to greater powers. Um, and I think that's just something that's never going to, I think the Obama administration recognizes that. I think, in fact, the Europeans recognize it as well, that Iran is not going to give up the right to enrich uranium. Um, it's a question of what other kind of deal can be made. Now, of course, the question is that in this election here in the United States, is any deal possible at all? And I, I, I highly doubt it at this point. Larry Cobb, if Iran is allowed under the terms of the NPT uh, to enrich uranium to whatever percentage it believes it needs, what is the point of contention here then? Well, the point is that the percentage that they enrich it to, in other words, there's a big difference between 5% enrichment and 20% enrichment. And remember, at one time, and early in the Obama administration, President Ahmadinejad had agreed to ship the 20 percent uranium uh, to, uh, to Russia to make sure that it couldn't be used for military purposes and bring it back for, for medical. So there's no doubt that they can enrich it. The real question is to what percentage and will they allow the inspectors in to make sure that it is for peaceful purposes? Trita Posse, uh, I you think mentioned I, earlier. I have to jump in yeah, there one go ahead. second. I just want to jump in right uh, uh, there. Iran never agreed to ship out 20% enrichment before because they didn't have 20% enrichment. Back then, the deal was to ship out the 3.5% enriched uranium. They only started enriching to 20% in 2009. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that actually there are inspectors in Iran, and the inspectors are continuously monitoring Iranian sites. So I think that we also have to be, I mean, at least the audience has to be aware of that fact. Yes, there are inspectors, yeah. but the question is, can the inspectors go where they want based upon the intelligence that they get from the P5 plus one countries? Right. And was the agreement that Iran would ex export this low enriched uranium and in return get right. uh, high Th There was in 2009 conversations about this. And at that moment, the Iranians did not say yes to the proposal. In 2010, the Brazilians and the Turks uh, made an attempt successfully and got the Iranians to agree to it. But at that point, the political climate in Washington had changed and the administration rejected their uh, uh, mediation and instead went for sanctions. I don't think Iran has the right to enrich at any level. I think uh, the definition that the IEA has is that highly enriched uranium starts above 20 percent. Low enriched uranium, meaning below 20 percent, and what the Iranians have done is to 19.75 percent, is permitted. But here's the thing. The Iranians themselves say that they don't need this. And from the Western perspective, they want Iran to stop this because this enables them to be closer to a weapons capability. There is clearly an opportunity to be able to find an agreement here, because if the Iranians say that they don't need this, that is a signal saying they're willing to negotiate that away. The question then is, what is the West willing to put on the table to get the Iranians to stop 19.75 percent? And what happened in Baghdad was that of the various things that were put on the table, sanctions relief was not one of them. And from the Iranian perspective, they view this as too big of a concession for too little of a concession from the Western side. And it's going to take some time to be able to find some sort of an equilibrium. But I personally doubt that an agreement can be found if there isn't at least some form of sanctions relief involved uh, in the deal in return for some tangible, verifiable, valuable concession from the Iranian side. And that's where the domestic political situation in Washington comes into play, as Human mentioned. Yeah. Uh, America's flexibility on sanctions relief is not particularly high in the middle of an election year, particularly with a Congress that is almost sabotaging Obama's diplomatic strategy here. The Europeans may, however, be in a different position, and we may see a European concession in Moscow instead in order to keep the process alive. Uh, Larry, you know, one of the complaints yeah, I, I, that have come from that, the Iranians, yeah. I'll come to you in a moment, Human. Uh, one of their complaints is that the current proposals on the table, these proposals are, as they put it, unbalanced, that they're not fair. And if we look at it on the face of it, what the world powers are asking for is for Iran to open its facilities to inspections, for Iran to restrict the manner in which and how much it enriches uh, uranium. And in return, what they're going to get in the short term are spare parts for its civilian planes. Does that sound fair? Well, again, I think, as Trita pointed out, this is an opening of negotiations. Uh, if the P5 plus one with the United States in the lead would say, gee, we're going to drop sanctions right now, it just would not, uh, it would not, be, it would not be possible. And I think the key thing is 
that each time they talk, they get closer to what we're, what we're, what we're dealing with here because they hadn't talked for the longest time, so they go to Istanbul and they lay the groundwork. Then before these talks, you saw some movement on allowing the inspectors to go places they had not been permitted to go uh, before. And I think this time, I think the Iranians said, okay, this is what we're willing to do. What are you willing to do? And they did basically say Yeah, is the point. danger here is that, you know, both sides set these preconditions and then just sit back and wait for the other guy to blink? Well, the key thing I think is going to be in Moscow uh, when they meet June 16th and 17th, the Europeans sanctions begin July 1st and they're going to be much more difficult you know much more stringent than the ones you right. have now to me that t is going to be an issue that I think that will drive both sides and I think Trita has a good point where the Europeans might have more flexibility you know what was interesting when uh, Miss, uh, 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 Miss Ashton was talking today she said didn't say P5 plus one she said E3 plus three in other words mm -hmm. the Europeans taking the lead on this, and I think that will, you know, politically, that that will, uh, uh, I think, lead to better results. Okay, let's go to Human Majid in New York. You wanted to say something earlier on, Human. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> I was agreeing with. <laughs> it was very important. I was agreeing with Trita. I was agreeing with Trita, but yeah. I think, <laughs> but I think this 20 percent enrichment thing is, is, uh, you know, the Iranians have. Trita's absolutely right. The Iranians have always said they don't need 20 percent enrichment if somebody would sell them the fuel for the Tehran reactor. Um, so that is something easy for them to give up, but they're not going to give it up unless they get something in return. Um, and I think, as as Larry and Trita both mentioned, in Moscow, you you're going to have to see something. Um, that is sanctions related, uh, some sort of concession that is sanctions related. I just don't know that even if that is offered, whether the United States um, can sign on to something where Iran is continuing to enrich at even three and a half percent, um, only for political reasons. I mean, I don't know if, if you know, the, right now the position of the United States remains, according to the State Department and according to the United States, that there should be no, in, that all enrichment has to be suspended. That's certainly Israel's position. Um, so I don't know in an election year if that is a possibility at all. But if it is, great. Then, then you know, I think there is some, there is an, there's an ability to have progress in, in Moscow, yeah. If I can add one thing. Um, there's a need for both sides to be able to go back home and claim that they got something or that they won something, that this was not a defeat for them. Keeping both sides not necessarily completely happy but content is critical, otherwise the process will collapse. The issue though is that from the Iranian side they're looking for what they can get. From the American side they're looking for what they didn't give in the sense that there's so much pressure on the Obama administration not to give anything. And from the Iranian side, they need to be able to say, I find it very difficult that they would be able to claim a victory if they seize 20%, but then you still have oil sanctions kick in three weeks later. It's not going to be possible for them to spin that as a win domestically or to their own elite. So as a result, it's going to be taking some time and some finesse to get this done. But I'm impressed by the fact that there is an unprecedented willingness on all sides to keep the process alive. And I think it's clearly because neither side can afford the disaster of seeing these talks collapse. Okay. Yet there are some on the right of the American political spectrum that believes that the United States has given, uh, let's say, supplied too much carrot to Iran and there's not been not enough stick. It's true. They've been writing articles saying that there's been too much carrot. But Curiously, they've not been able to identify a single carrot. Right. So I think these are politically motivated attacks. And, but it, it shows that difficulty the Obama administration has in the sense of having the political space so that if the Iranians give a tangible, verifiable, valuable concession, Obama has the political space to be able to take yes for an answer. Right. And unfortunately, the political opponents are trying to make that impossible for him to do so. So some of the toughest the negotiations way, may actually not take place in Baghdad, may not take place in Moscow. It may take <coughs> place in this very city, at home, between the various political uh, factions here. Okay, Larry? Yeah, one way, uh, face-saving way for everybody would be something that was in the Financial Times today where they talked about the fact that we would say that the Europeans would provide insurance for people sell, you know, shipping Iranian oil to Asia. 
and that would be one way in which that you would be moving. Theoretically, the Europeans and the Americans would not be buying it. The Asians would, which they, in many ways they do. But come one July, if they can't get insurance, you won't be. And most of the insurance comes from London. You're not going to be able to, you know, uh, get anybody to uh, take that oil to to Asia. So that might be, uh, you know, one thing. And and the other thing, Obama's already paid a big political price. The fact that. This is going to be the third negotiation. I can tell you tomorrow people are going to be saying, see, they're just playing for time. And while you're negotiating, they're enriching and getting closer and closer. So he's already paid a, a political price. But while right. he might pay a political price with the con not with the American people. As Hans Blix mentioned, American people are tired of wars. They don't want any more wars. And the idea that you would attack a country with 70, 80 million people after what happened in, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan just won't sell. Okay. It shows this tremendous yeah. disconnect that currently mm -hmm. exists between the mood in Congress and the mood in the country. Right. You know, there appears to be also a difference between the IAEA's assessment of Iran's intentions and the P5 plus 1's assessment. I mean, last November, the UN's, uh, that's the nuclear watchdog, the IAEA, they published a report saying that Iran's nuclear program was showing military dimensions. It said that Iran has carried out tests relevant to the development of a nuclear explosive device. The report went on to highlight Iran's, quote, acquisition of nuclear weapons, development information and documentation from a clandestine nuclear supply network, as well as work on the development of an indigenous design of a nuclear weapon, including the testing of components. Let me go to Human Majid again. Now we hear from the IAEA Director General, Yukir Amano, that, you know, there's hope for a deal here. I mean, is this something premature or does he know something that we don't know? No, I think he knows that in the report that came out last year, that was referring to stuff that happened way in the past. It wasn't current, um, the allegations. And so they were just going back to the allegations that have always existed from the IAEA that Iran has always denied, has always said, like the, the, the computer that they had, which was supplied to them by a, a foreign intelligence uh, agency, was a, you know, a fraud, was a forgery. Um, so it, I don't think there was any really new information in the, in the 2011 report. Uh, any information that he has now is that basically the Iranians are seem to be more cooperative in terms of allowing more unfettered access to, to, to the sites that they want to yeah. um, visit, such as, a, such as military sites, which, by the way, under the NPT, you don't have to allow, you only have to allow visits to sites right. that are declared nuclear sites. Okay. Trudeau, let's look at the... And, they, and you know, one has yeah. to remember that Iranians, one has to remember that Iranians... Uh, one of the reasons they're hesitant to allow the kind of access that the IEA wants, such as access to their scientists, access to military sites, et cetera, et cetera, is that they believe that some of that information has gotten back to foreign intelligence agencies that has resulted in, you know, the, the assassination of their scientists, for example, right. and the, the ability for the West to introduce uh, uh, computer worms into their networks, into their facilities, stuff like that. So okay. I think there's a, there's a real paranoia on the Iranian side about right. allowing unfettered access. Okay, and I want to get to another situation on the Iranian side, and that is domestic political issues in Iran. Uh, is there a division in the religious leadership under Ayatollah Khamenei and uh, the sort of the presidential leadership under uh, Ahmadinejad? Well, Ahmadinejad's political strength has been significantly weakened, and he's not driving this process. In fact, Khamenei has um, claimed far greater authority and has far greater proximity now to this negotiation process, which is quite unique. In the past, he's always kept a certain calculated distance so that he could um, escape the blame of failure while still being able to take credit for any success if it were to occur. But I think the flip side of him taking greater control, which incidentally I think in the West has been welcomed because there's a greater confidence that they're negotiating with the real decision maker. The flip side is that the price for compromise may also have increased. Because for him to step in and take ownership over this process, he's going to require some concessions from the other side uh, that are going to be perhaps a bit more significant than the ones that perhaps the Iranians would have accepted in the past. Okay, Larry Cobb, what can we expect to come out of Moscow? Well, I think Moscow is going to be critical because if this July 1st date, if they go ahead with the European sanctions, both the, on the oil and financial, I don't think there's any hope after that. So I think you've got to come up at least with some steps in which they allow more inspections, talk about shipping the fuel, or do this Asia thing that I, that I mentioned before. I think uh, that really has, uh, has to happen. I do worry. I mean, if it doesn't happen in, in June, come 1 July, and then you put these really difficult sanctions in, I don't know if you can ever get back to the bargaining table after that. Mm -hmm. 
And it's interesting, don't want to sound conspiratorial, but clearly there is a reason why the date was put somewhere around 17th and 18th of June, because the Europeans would need, because of their legal processes, at least 10 days or so to be able to go through the process of agreeing and uh, coming to a consensus on delaying these sanctions. Okay. So it's really the last moment there. Right, and I'm afraid that's where we have to uh, bring it to an end. We've run out of time. Larry Korb, Trita Parsi, and Human Majid in New York, thanks for joining us. And that is it from the team here in Washington, D.C. for now. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Facebook where you can find more information about the program. And, of course, we want to hear from you. Tell us what stories you think we should be covering. Send your ideas directly to us at InsideStory at AlJazeera.net. Thanks for being with us.